My name is Pete Betke. I'm a uh, professor here in the economics department um, and the director of the F.A. Hayek program for advanced study in philosophy, politics, and economics at the Mercatus Center. On behalf of the Fund for the Study of Spontaneous Order at Atlas um, Economic Research Foundation, um, which Bill Dennis, Bill, where are you at? Bill Dennis and Leonard Liggio, Leonard, raise your hand, uh, and myself uh, have uh, uh, been in charge of for the last decade, um, and the Liberty Fund, Alan Russell, um, and also the Mercatus Center. I, I don't believe that Tyler is here. He's the director, um, but Claire Morgan is here. Claire, so people know who you are. Um, we would like to welcome all of you uh, to this celebration of the work of Israel Kirzner um, and his contributions to the field of economics. Um, serving as our MC today um, is Professor Mario Rizzo, uh, who is Professor Kirzner's longtime associate in the Department of Economics at NYU and, uh, and in the Austrian Economics program there as well. Um, Professor Rizzo is the author of The Economics of Time and Ignorance, uh, which is a classic in modern Austrian economics, as well as the forthcoming work from Cambridge University Press that uh, addresses behavioral economics um, and the new paternalism. Um, Professor Rizzo has published numerous articles in the areas of law and economics, ethics and economics, the philosophy and methodology of economics, and the Austrian School of Economics. I'm going to turn the podium over to Mario, who will uh, introduce the event and the various speakers. But uh, please welcome Mario Rizzo. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here today to honor Professor Kirzner. I've never been an MC before, and uh, my impression of an MC is you make jokes all the time. And the only jokes I could think of were two types. One, very bad taste, and the other uh, that only I would understand. I would laugh, but none of you would. So I think I'll, for uh, I'll forego the jokes. Um, so today, uh, we're going to have a number of speakers uh, to discuss Kirzner's contributions and, um, and appreciation of Professor Kirzner. Our first speaker was supposed to be uh, Henry Manny, uh, but unfortunately, Henry Manny has the flu and will not be able uh, to be here. As you, all of you must know, Henry Manny is one of the most important figures in the founding of the law and economics movement. Uh, and I would have enjoyed very much uh, to see him here today. Um, instead, Professor uh, Don Boudreau uh, will read his remarks. Don is, was chairman of the Department of Economics here uh, at uh, GMU for eight years, 2001 to 2009. Uh, he was also president of FEE, uh, but his most important achievement was that he received an MA from New York University, our Austrian program, before he decided to abandon us to go to Auburn. I've never forgiven him for that. Uh, but nevertheless, he's a good guy, and he's going to uh, <laughs> read uh, Henry Manny's remarks. Thank you. Thanks, Mario. Um, I have the... Uh, probably the most enviable assignment uh, that I've ever had. I, I get to give remarks, and you cannot blame me for the quality <laughs> of those remarks. If they're good, you can accuse me of, of uh, improving on Henry Manny's work. If they're bad, complain to Henry. Uh, I woke up this morning, checked my email, uh, and there was this frantic email from Pete. Uh, promising me several hundred thousand dollars <laughs> from Mercatus, all cash. Uh, <clears throat> I was alert to that opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> if I could substitute for Henry Manny, and I've never before been asked to substitute for uh, Henry Manny. It's, it's quite an honor. I'm a great uh, fan of Henry's work, and he's become something of a friend over the years. Uh, but I've also, I realize I've, I've been asked to substitute for uh, a man of, uh, uh, who's much older than me. I figure I can substitute for old men. I'm becoming one myself. Um, and so I will uh, display to you uh, the, the effects of advanced age <laughs> and tenure. 
<laughs> Just don't slow your roll. Um, no, not, none of us here. This is George Mason, and, and we're Austrians. We're all, we're, t tenure has no effect on us. Um, I, I, so I read, I, 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 in, in all seriousness, I was, I was signed up to come to the dinner tonight, which I will still uh, attend. Um, in fact, I'll donate my $100,000 back to Mercatus as, as my dinner fee. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but I, I, had, I was not planning to come to the event because I had some other personal matters to attend to. Um, the cell phone makes it possible for me to attend to those personal matters while being here as well. So we live in a wonderful world, stuff we couldn't have done uh, even in 10 years ago, uh, multitasking in that way. Pete sent me by email Henry's paper, which I downloaded on my cell phone. I hit a button and I ran up to my son's bedroom where he has his printer and I printed out the paper. It's really a remarkable uh, uh, world. He complained that I was using his ink and paper, but I told him that I paid for it, and so <laughs> he shut up. Um, I read Henry's paper, so I, I, I'm not going to read Henry's paper. That would be dull and boring. I'm sure he wouldn't, even he wouldn't have read it. I'll try to summarize what I take to be its point. I, I, I confess that it's a bit uh, uh, oblique to me. I, I've read it three times in the past several hours. I think I'm starting to get it, uh, but I, I, I do hope that I, I'm sure I won't do it justice because I, I've learned from reading Henry's work uh, over the years that it is a, it, it's at a depth and it has a nuance and a richness and layers to it that uh, uh, it takes me a while to, to, to grab in full. And so I'm sure I don't yet have it all. So in, in all seriousness, no, all joking aside, um, the, the paper I'm sure is much deeper than I will be able to relate to you. Uh, the best way to summarize Henry's paper, which is entitled Resurrecting the Ghostly Entrepreneur, it's an intriguing title, uh, is that uh, is, is it, it's an attempt to save entrepreneurship, particularly Kersnerian entrepreneurship, from Harold Demsetz. Uh, I thought I had read pretty much every word that Harold Demsetz ever wrote, but I missed the paper, or a paper, and I'm not sure exactly where it is because Henry's notes are not, not clear on this matter. Demsetz wrote a paper many years ago in which he um, uh, apparently, on Henry's interpretation, dismissed the entrepreneur as really not, not existing. Uh, entrepreneurship is a deus ex machina, according to Demsetz, in the works of, of Schumpeter, uh, and in the works of Kersner, it's a little bit better, it's, it's, it's alertness, it, it's, it's something that we can, we can identify, but, says Demsetz through Henry Manny, uh, alertness, as Kersner explains it, really, really amounts to nothing more than just pretty much good luck. And once the entrepreneur has the lucky uh, recognition that a profit opportunity exists, then the Robinsian maximizer takes over and, and entrepreneurship is gone. And so in Demsetz's work, as Manny interprets it, uh, entrepreneurship is reduced to these, these lucky flashes of, of luck, these fortunate flashes of luck, and there's not much to do about it, according to Demsetz. Manny says, well, not so fast, uh, Harold. He says, and so I will read you one, I think the key passage from Henry's paper, in which he uh, believes that Kersner, uh, in fact, supplies an out uh, for salvaging a genuine theory of entrepreneurship, a substantive theory of entrepreneurship, making it something more than mere luck. So after D Demsetz says, well, yeah, alertness is something, but it's really just, just luck, uh, <coughs> Manny says, and now I'm quoting Henry Manny, uh, this is the middle of his paper, at this, quoting Manny, at this point, Demsetz, one of the fathers of modern property rights theory, demonstrates a very uncharacteristic lack of alertness, a moment of Homeric nodding. Having made his point that alertness is usually a form of investment under conditions of uncertainty, he follows up with what he apparently sees as the main implication of that insight. Now Henry's quoting Demsetz. If the political system allows persons to retain a larger fraction of the profit created by being alert to lucky events, there will be more alertness, a response difficult to reconcile with the belief that alertness requires 
no resources. End of quotation from Demsetz, back to quoting Manny. But the point he misses here is not some mystical quality, the point Demsetz misses, is not some mystical quality in the entrepreneur. Rather, it is the advantage of recognizing a distinctive kind of productive input in which one can have some form of property right, not generally considered in the neoclassical market model, an input closer to Kirzner's alertness than it is to Demsetz's luck, though perhaps with elements of each, what I will call the idea. And then Manny launches into the substantive contribution of his paper. He says that Kirznerian alertness, I'm putting this in my own words now, Kirznerian alertness, entrepreneurial <clears throat> alertness, is an attempt by entrepreneurs to create a property right, to gain a property right in ideas that by their very nature are very difficult for the legal system to create, define, and enforce a property right in. Uh, this is Don Boudreau now speaking. I find this to be ra rather nebulous at, at this point. Again, I've only, I've only uh, uh, encountered the paper today. I think what Henry Manny is getting at is that there are, there, there's, there are certain ideas that are, that are valuable, not, not only to the individual who might have those, that idea for as long as he or she can exploit it, but valuable to society at large, ideas that make the economy more productive, expand the output <clears throat> of consumer goods, cause the, price of product, uh, the cost of production to fall. Most of these ideas, or many of these ideas, are very difficult for the legal system, and Henry is a lawyer, I will remind you, for the legal system to uh, instantiate as enforceable property rights. The Manny slash Kersner, or I should say Kersner slash Manny, entrepreneur, is someone who is alert to opportunities to take advantage, to seize these ideas and to use them in ways that for, at, at, for long enough at least, gives the entrepreneur ample time to earn profit to make it worth that entrepreneur's while to pursue the activity and hence move the economy for move it closer to equilibrium or, or, or uh, uh, further promote economic growth. So it's, a, it's, a, it, it's, it's, it's the market's way, the entrepreneur is the market's way of creating property rights in ideas that the legal system, by its nature, being ham-fisted, and I don't say that much as a criticism, just it's, it, it, it's, it, 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 it's, it's an administrative system, that the legal system finds difficult or impossible to create and enforce property rights in. And then Manny goes on um, talking about the, and this is his term now, the idea of the idea. So he's very, he, he likes the idea, his idea is the idea of the idea. He likes the idea, and, the, and, and, and it's this idea that can't, that can't be made into a property right in the same way that a patented idea can be made into a property right, or uh, a literary idea can be made into a property right in the form of, 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 of copyright. It's, a, it's an entrepreneurial idea. And that's what Kersner slash Manny entrepreneurs are alert to, these opportunities to create, um, I think mostly they're temporary, but, but these fleeting property rights in profitable ideas that promote mutually beneficial exchange. I will end, and I probably shouldn't do this because I'm giving Manny's paper, I shouldn't end with a criticism of Manny, but Henry's not here, and if he sees this, he'll only see it in video, and he'll be too far away to reach me. <laughs> but anyway, it, I, I, my, my criticism is that he gets very close near the end of his paper to uh, he sounds very much like the late Julian Simon. You know, Julian Simon's greatest contribution is his notion of the human mind as being the ultimate resource. Nothing is a resource until the human mind puts its creativity or alertness to it, to, 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 to discovering ways to turn raw materials, uh, price differences, or what have you, into profitable uh, opportunities. And Manny, toward the end of his paper, comes very close to, to 
having a way to, to bring in the work of Julian Simon to that of Israel Kirzner uh, and entrepreneurship. And he doesn't quite do it. Maybe I shouldn't criticize him for what he doesn't do. Uh, so I will focus in, at the end of my remarks here on, on what I think is the benefit of what he does do. I think the idea, the idea of the idea, as Henry calls it, the idea that um, uh, there are opportunities that, uh, profit opportunities, undefinable by, unenforceable by the formal legal system, but that nevertheless are valuable, and that entrepreneurs in the market are the agents who are alert to those opportunities and seize upon them and figure out ways to put them into action. I think it's a very important uh, insight. I, of course, I can't speak for how, uh, how well uh, Israel Kirzner thinks this is uh, consistent with his theory, or the late Joseph Schumpeter thinks it's consistent with his theory, or the late Julian Simon would think is consistent with his, with his theory. But it strikes me uh, from the draft of the paper that I read from the great Henry Manny that, uh, in fact, uh, Manny has moved the ball a little bit forward in improving our understanding of the role of the entrepreneur in a market society. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mario uh, and Don. It's a great pleasure to share the stage with uh, Professors uh, Rizzo and Boudreau. I have known them both for many years, but had no idea they were both such skilled comedians. Um, <clears throat> I certainly can't match uh, uh, the joke telling, but I uh, certainly encourage you to keep your tenured professorships as long as you can. Um, but it's really a, 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 a supreme pleasure to be on, on this panel uh, to recognize the contributions of Professor Kersner, not only in economics, but also in the field of business administration, which is where I want to focus uh, the intention in my remarks uh, today. So what I, what I want to do here is a little bit different from what uh, Henry Manny uh, uh, does uh, in his paper, and Don, I also did receive a copy of the paper, but had the luxury of not reading it yet. Um, <clears throat> you don't have to now. Yeah, now I'll just read the Boudreaux, just study the Boudreaux uh, summary. But <clears throat> uh, I, I don't want to offer a sort of uh, you know synthesis and critique of uh, Professor Kirshner's thought, but rather to talk a little bit more broadly about the influence of Prof uh, Professor Kirshner's work uh, in a variety of uh, fields. So um, let me take you back to competition and entrepreneurship, uh, Professor Kirshner's path-breaking 1973 book. I'm going to spend some time talking about competition and entrepreneurship today, not because, it recognize, uh, not because it represents the most mature statement of Professor Kirshner's thesis, but because it's a very well-known and highly cited work and a useful reference point. Um, you know, I just pulled up some of the reviews of the book that came out immediately after its publication in 1973. Uh, a I have here a, a review by Henry Hazlitt and a review by Murray Rothbard. A Hazlitt remarked, writing in The Freeman, uh, about Kirzner, by applying his Austrian concepts and analysis very thoroughly and patiently to the immense body of literature on price theory that has appeared in England and America over the last generation, Kirzner has not only succeeded in exposing its central fallacies, in other words, the central fallacies of mainstream market economics, uh, uh, but has arrived at penetrating insights and advances in market theory. Uh, Murray Rothbard wrote, uh, described Kirzner's book as an outstanding contribution to the Mises-Hayek analysis of microeconomics. And note the context. Uh, it, it comes at a time of increasing dissatisfaction with the positivist and behaviorist methodology and alleged value freedom of orthodox microeconomics, as well as with its almost exclusive emphasis on the unrealistic model of static equilibrium. Now, uh, uh, 1973, 1974 was a little bit before my time. Uh, you know, Mario was, what, you were a full professor at that point. Uh, but, uh, you know, I can only imagine what it must have been, what it must have been like to be around in those heady days. So the Austrian revival was just beginning to gather momentum at that point. Hayek's Nobel Prize and the South Royalton Conference would, would uh, be coming in the next year. 
Um, but there must have been uh, a lot of anticipation among the enthusiastic readers of this book about how it might reshape orthodox microeconomics, right? There was a feeling at that time that orthodox microeconomics was missing a lot. You know, Rothbard refers to the increasing dissatisfaction from a variety of different points of view. And so one might have expected that uh, uh, you know, the works of the Austrians, uh, Professor Kirchner in particular, would be able to push that orthodoxy to the side and replace it with something that would be more thoroughgoingly and consistently Austrian. Well, I mean, there were a number of criticisms of the orthodoxy uh, that, that uh, appeared around this time. If you go back to the 1960s and 1970s, of course, the Austrian revival, as I've already mentioned, Rothbard's uh, uh, theoretical works from the 1960s and the works of Kirzner and others in the 1970s were gaining increasing attention for the Austrian school. But you had a number of other traditions that also in different ways were challenging some of the, uh, some of the uh, presuppositions of orthodox mainstream neoclassical economics, the Chicago, UCLA property rights tradition and I would put Harold Demsetz and Henry Manny in that, in that category, broadly speaking. You had transaction cost economics from Oliver Williamson, Benjamin Klein, and others, <coughs> modern information economics, and so forth, agency theory, et cetera. All of which were pointing out you know, the, the, some very important defects in the, the Arrow de Bru style model of general equilibrium that dominated orthodox microeconomics. Now, what do we see in mainstream economics, micro in particular, uh, in, you know, in, in 2013? Well, I mean, certainly there are a lot of new fields uh, that uh, you know, are increasingly important and have become part of the orthodoxy, agency theory and, and mechanism design, other parts of information economics, game theory, of course, some of the so-called new property rights theory or incomplete contracting theory associated with people like Oliver Hart, um, so the, the, these certainly, uh, the, these, these bodies of literature certainly um, emphasize aspects of economics that were not part of the mainstream consensus prior to the 1960s and 70s, but I think most of us would uh, uh, say that they aren't very Austrian in spirit or in execution, that at best they pay superficial attention to some of the issues about time and process and resource heterogeneity, disequilibrium, and so forth that have long been associated with the Austrian tradition. Of course, macroeconomics is, I won't waste your time describing the, the, the fail, uh, failings or drawbacks of modern macro. So, you know, one might look at the field today and say, well, gosh, uh, you know, orthodox microeconomics, you know, took a few of our ideas and maybe tried to deal with them in a superficial way but there hasn't been the kind of revolution that maybe some of us were hoping for. Now, what I want to claim uh, today is that we get a misleading picture of the influence of the Austrian school and Professor Kirchner's work in particular if we look only at what's going on in the orthodox economics departments, right? So why have the Austrians not succeeded in overthrowing the orthodoxy? I mean, there are a number of potential explanations one could give. Maybe, maybe we just haven't been good enough. Uh, we haven't worked hard enough, and if we can just continue to produce more and better work, eventually things will turn our way. Maybe there's some kind of institutional explanation that has to do with funding and the influence of government sponsorship. I see Professor White in the background, who's done a very nice piece on, you've, I'm sure most of you have seen on, in Econ Journal Watch, on the influence of the Federal Reserve System on research in monetary economics. Um, you know, m maybe uh, we should not really even care that much about the mainstream to borrow a, a Pete Bedke uh, uh, distinction and say, well, uh, Austrian economics is part of the main line of economic thinking, even if it isn't mainstream, and at some point eventually the Austrians will reclaim, you know, their place at the head of the table or at least close to the head of the table as they, uh, you know, the place they had in the late 19th century, early 20th centuries. Now. Uh, an alternative uh, way of thinking about this problem is to look beyond mainstream economics and beyond economics uh, uh, entirely and look at sort of related social science disciplines. So we might ask what is the influence of the Austrian school and Professor Kirchner's work in particular 
on research in political science or sociology or law or history or anthropology or whatever. Um, we might also look at the field of business administration, particularly research in strategic management and entrepreneurship. And I've been doing an increasing amount of work in the strategic management and entrepreneurship fields in recent years. And when I started working in these areas, um, I was surprised, I would even say shocked, by how familiar many management and entrepreneurship scholars are with the work of the Austrians and Professor Kirzner in particular. I often joke that, you know, if one goes to the uh, American <clears throat> Economic Association and speaks loudly about Austrian economics, Austrian business cycle theory, tacit knowledge, and so forth, you know, one is always a little bit wary of setting off some kind of alarm and, you know, the, the security people will come and sort of haul you away. But at the uh, leading uh, professional associations in management and entrepreneurship, the Austrians are considered to be just another one of the important and influential and uh, worthy, of further, worthy of being studied schools of thought in economics. Um, I was teasing Mario a little bit. I, I actually brought some data because, you know, we Austrians are very quantitative. So uh, I, I just want to show you some, some charts that were prepared by a colleague of mine at the University of Missouri, Todd Childs, who's done some bibliographic uh, 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 work on uh, the influence of the Austrians. This is a chart. I don't know, you, you probably can't see the names on the right-hand side. Th this is a chart showing citations in the Social Science Citation Index to the works of leading Austrians. So if you do a Social Science Citation Index search for leading Austrian authors, among journals in the, what, in, in the field of, area of organization studies broadly defined, um, so these are not economics journals, but these are journals in management, organization theory, and so forth, um, there's, uh, uh, Austrians are being cited at an increasing rate so, I mean, these are cumulative numbers, right? But if you see that the cumulative curves are increasing at an increasing rate, the line on the top represents citations to Joseph Schumpeter. And, you know, most of us would put Joseph Schumpeter in his own category, not a member of the Austrian school narrowly defined. But so Schumpeter has far and away the most citations in journals and books in organization studies. But the second most heavily cited Austrian economist is Israel Kirzner, uh, more heavily cited uh, than F.A. Hayek, or Ludwig Lachmann, or Mises, or Menger, or Shackle, or Rothbard. I didn't put any of the four of us on the chart because I didn't want to embarrass Professor Kirzner, you know, with our huge numbers of citations. Um, uh, so uh, this is sort of interesting. I, I don't have the... Uh, 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 I don't have the same chart plotted for the top economics journals. But I'm fairly confident that the rate of citation to the Austrians, annual citation rates are not increasing for, uh, among you know, the AER and JPE and so forth. Um, if you just look at Professor Kirzner alone, this is a slightly different set of journals. This is also a slide prepared by Todd Childs. Uh, these, are, uh, these are the leading journals in management, Academy of Management Journal, Academy of Management Review, Administrative Science Quarterly, some of the entrepreneurship journals, such as the Journal of Business Venturing, uh, management science and so forth. So, you know, the, if you're not familiar with these journals, this is the AER, the JPE, the QJE, the Econometrica, the RE stat of the field of management. And so citations to Kirzner uh, are occurring at, with increasing frequency uh, every year. <clears throat> I did a little bit of digging around on Google Scholar to find out who is citing Professor Kirzner's work. Now, this is just, again, for, uh, for illustration. I just looked up citations to competition and entrepreneurship, which, of course, is Professor Kirzner's most heavily cited work, though, as I said before, it's an early statement of his views on entrepreneurial discovery. Uh, the book has 4,540 Google Scholar sites, which, if you don't know, that's a lot. Um, and, and so I looked at uh, what uh, books and articles are citing competition and entrepreneurship. Here are the most heavily cited books that cite Kirzner. So if you sort by uh, citations of the citing works, uh, it's sort of an interesting list. You have uh, David Teese's book on uh, dynamic capabilities and innovation, Williamson's Economic Institutions of Capitalism, a very influential book by Ron Burt on structural holes, 
Nozick's Anarchy, State, and Utopia. I'm not, that's sort of an, uh, an outlier on that list, I suppose. Um, but one thing that you don't see on this list is a lot of, you know, textbooks or treatises by, you know, sort of mainstream economic thinkers. <clears throat> Now you might say, well, that's just an artifact of looking at books because mainstream economists don't write books, right? They only write articles. So what happens if you just look at articles? So these are the most heavily cited in decreasing order of articles that cite competition and entrepreneurship, according to Google Scholar. Uh, so the, at the top of the list is an extremely influential paper that I'll say more about in just a moment by Scott Shane and Venkat Venkataraman called The Promise of Entrepreneurship as a field of research, sort of a landmark article uh, sort of explaining the basics of entrepreneurship theory to scholars in management, published in the Academy of Management Review, the number one ranked journal in management. Uh, another paper by Scott Shane in Organization Science. There's uh, this paper by Evans and Jovanovic is sort of a, it's a lab labor economics paper. Um, it uses what I have referred to elsewhere uh, as the occupational takes the occupational perspective on entrepreneurship, meaning that entrepreneurship is defined as self-employment. And so these are empirical papers, uh, sorry, one theoretical and one uh, empirical paper that try to estimate the decision to be employed or self-employed as a function of various characteristics. So it's, it's, they're not really talking about entrepreneurship as we Austrians would understand entrepreneurship as an economic function. Uh, Professor Kirshner's own uh, important Journal of Economic Literature piece comes next. And there are a few others, a piece on uh, competitiveness, uh, another labor economics piece, piece in GIBO and so forth. The point I want to make is that these are all very important articles and these are high quality articles, but they are not sort of general works <coughs> in price theory. Okay, these are not sort of everyday works on different you know, aspects of mundane economics that are making reference to the Austrian way of thinking about competition and entrepreneurship. Now, does that mean that the Austrians aren't having the influence uh, that was anticipated in 1973 or 4? No, what it means is that that influence has gone in a slightly different direction than was anticipated, right? So in the field of management studies and entrepreneurship studies in particular, the influence of the Austrians is vast. I don't want to bore you with too much, you know, bibliometrics. Uh, but I did the same exercise for the Social Science Citation Index, and then I listed the journals in which the citing articles appear. So which journals are most likely to publish an article that cites competition and entrepreneurship? In decreasing order, notice who dominates the list. Uh, it's the journals of entrepreneurship and management. Mm -hmm. Journal of Business Venturing, Small Business Economics are the top two or two of the top three journals in entrepreneurship. Strategic Management Journal is a A-plus journal in management. Entrepreneurship Theory and Practice, Journal of Management Studies. You know, you don't see American Economic Review and Journal of Political Economy and so forth here. What that says to me is that when, if we want to find out where Austrian ideas in general and Kersnerian ideas in particular have really taken root and have really challenged the fundamental way that scholars think about the underlying phenomena, we should pay a little more attention to the management and entrepreneurship literature. By my uh, uh, rough estimate, I, I think uh, Professor Kirzner is the third most heavily cited economic theorist uh, in the management literature, after Schumpeter and Oliver Williamson, more heavily cited in general in the management journals than, you know, than Coase, than Baumol, Alshin, even more, more heavily cited than Hayek. Um, let me talk just a moment about Scott Shane's work. Uh, if you look at the, you know, what I'll call the mainstream entrepreneurship literature, so research that appears in the Journal of Business Venturing and Entrepreneurship Theory and Practice and so forth, um, there's, there's a sort of a variety of different perspectives and points of view, but if anything can be called a mainstream or dominant or even orthodox perspective, within mainstream entrepreneurship studies, it would be what is called the opportunity discovery perspective. The opportunity discovery perspective. What does that sound like? Well, this is work that is very explicitly built upon Kersnerian foundations. Uh, this paper by Shane and Venkataraman that I mentioned before uh, got an award in 2011 for the most influential management article published in the previous 10 years. Um, 
Uh, Scott Shane has a book uh, elaborating this perspective, a general theory of entrepreneurship, it's called. Now, this is not, what, by any means, uh, I wouldn't call this a strictly Kirzhnerian treatment, but is a treatment that is very heavily influenced by Kirzhner and very influential in the management literature. There's a lengthy quotation from, from Scott Shane's book trying to explain what entrepreneurship is, but just notice some of the highlighted phrases. According to Shane, entrepreneurship is an activity that involves the discovery, evaluation, and exploitation of opportunities. Opportunities to introduce new goods and services, new ways of organizing, markets, process, and so forth, uh, through organizing efforts that previously had not existed. So entrepreneurship is the study of the discovery, the evaluation, and the exploitation of opportunities. Now, opportunity evaluation and opportunity exploitation might not uh, sound very Kirzhnerian, but certainly uh, opportunity discovery comes straight out of Professor Kirzhner's idea of, entrepreneurial, of, the, of entrepreneurship as alertness or discovery. Now, notice Shane goes on, given this definition, definition of entrepreneurship, what is the field, what is the academic field of entrepreneurship research? Uh, the, 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 the academic field of entrepreneurship incorporates explanations for why, when, and how entrepreneurial opportunities exist, the sources of those opportunities and the forms that they take, the processes of opportunity discovery and evaluation, acquisition of resources for exploitation of opportunities, uh, why, when, and how some individuals and not others discover, evaluate, and exploit opportunities, and so forth. Now, Professor Kirzner himself has been somewhat critical of this literature, pointing out that it has taken the Kirzhnerian metaphor and pushed it in directions that the metaphor, or the, try to take it places that the metaphor was not designed to go. But you can see that before the entrepreneurship, before entrepreneurship scholars discovered Kirzhner, Entrepreneurship studies was just, you know, the empirical study of small business, small business management, small business finance, uh, small business growth rates, and so forth. There wasn't really an overarching theoretical perspective until scholars in that field discovered Kirzner's work. Now, there have been a number of criticisms offered of the opportunity discovery view in entrepreneurship. Professor Kirzner himself has pointed out, both indirectly and more directly, that this literature, while certainly taking some inspiration from the Kirzhnerian notions of alertness or discovery, has, has perhaps you know, not, not, not fully positioned them relative to what these ideas were designed to do. So Kirzner himself, of course, has pointed out that uh, the concept of opportunities in his work is meant to be taken metaphorically, not literally. So Professor Kirzner is not talking about literal $20 bills on the sidewalk, but rather metaphorical $20 bills on the sidewalk. He says in an interview in 1997, I do not mean to convey the idea that the future is a rolled up tapestry, you know, waiting, just sort of unfolding, and people sort of see things as the tapestry unfolds. Ex post, we have to recognize that when an innovator has discovered something new, that something was metaphorically waiting to be discovered. In other words, after profit opportunities, after profits have been earned, we can look back and say, wow, you know, gee, why didn't I think of that? If I had taken the same actions, I could have earned that profit too. I just didn't recognize that that opportunity was there. I could have gotten $10,000 or whatever it was that Don Boudreau got, but uh, <laughs> I, just, I walked right by the envelope as it was on the carpet. Um, Kirzner says in an extremely important uh, piece that uh, those of you, especially students, if you're interested in this area, look at uh, small business economics, 2000, I think it's early 2009, when uh, Professor Kirzner received an award from the association that publishes <coughs> small business economics, a sort of distinguished achievement in entrepreneurship studies. Professor Kirzner wrote a very interesting response, and I don't wish to put words in your mouth, but essentially saying, gee, thanks a lot, I appreciate it, this is very kind of you, but you guys really don't get it, do you? Um, one of the points he makes is that his own work, he says, my own work has nothing to say about the secrets of successful entrepreneurship. My work has exploited not the nature of the talents needed for entrepreneurial success, not any guidelines to be followed by would-be successful entrepreneurs, but instead the nature of the market process set in motion by the entrepreneurial decisions. In other words, 
for Professor Kersner, you know, entrepreneurship per se is not the phenomenon under investigation. That is not the phenomenon to be characterized and evaluated and to have its antecedents teased out and so forth. The phenomenon to be examined is equilibration or market clearing or the market process, to use Professor Kersner's terminology. And alertness or discovery is sort of, uh, you know, that's, that is, it's used instrumentally to explain the processes of market clearing. Uh, now, there have been another, a number of additional critiques of the opportunity discovery view within the management field. There's a sort of an ontological critique. These are my characterizations, uh, claiming that uh, uh, we should not think about opportunities being discovered, but rather opportunities being created endogenously through the acts of entrepreneurs. Uh, Sharon Alvarez and Jay Barney have written a number of papers uh, making this point. There's sort of a cognitive critique that the opportunity discovery view is sort of under theorizes the processes by which actual entrepreneurs think. Uh, Sarah Sarasvathy down in Charlottesville is uh, a leading representative of this view. Um, my, my own work uh, with Nikolai Foss has made uh, a, a slightly different kind of an argument, namely that uh, if we think of entrepreneurs, if we think of entrepreneurship as a part of human action, where uh, agents employ means to achieve desired ends, we should place more attention on the means rather than the opportunity. And in fact, you know, I, I, I've, I've claimed that uh, the, the metaphor of the opportunity is sort of, it, it's redundant at best and potentially misleading at worst, at worst, that we would be better off focusing on the investments made by agents, entrepreneurs, in order to, in their pursuit of profit, rather than thinking about a metaphorical opportunity that supposedly guides them uh, in this behavior. Uh, Mario is giving me an, an ugly look, although the official timekeeper says I have two minutes left, so, well, so I'm, I'm the official. I'm looking at her and not at you. Um, so, uh, well, uh, uh, you know, the, the view of entrepreneurship that I myself have propounded, I call it the judgment-based view. It's, uh, comes largely out of Frank Knight, it's an elaboration of Knight, or call it Knight plus Austrian capital theory, which might strike some of you as odd, if you know that Knight was a fierce critic of Austrian capital theory. But I think there's a Knight, I think there's a theory of entrepreneurship that comes out of Knight's view of judgment. Uh, the Austrian view of resources is subjectively perceived and heterogeneous. In our formulation, entrepreneurship is conceived not as discovery, but as judgmental decision making about the deployment of resources under conditions of uncertainty. And we draw out a number of implications for the theory of the firm and firm boundaries and organization and so forth. But the reason I bring this up here is to point out that uh, while we draw on Cantillon and Knight and Mises and Lachman, uh, when, I, when I first started thinking through this particular formulation of entrepreneurship, it was in the context of trying to write a paper for a festschrift for Professor Kirzner that was published in the Journal des Economistes in 2002. I think these guys were probably in the festschrift as well. And my co colleagues and I were reflecting on my favorite Kirzner book, which is not Competition and Entrepreneurship, but an essay on capital published in 1966. And it was thinking through professors, Professor Kirzner's reformulation of Austrian capital theory and the role of subjective uh, imagination on the part of the entrepreneur in the assessment of capital goods that got me thinking about a different role for the entrepreneur. So I would claim that my own approach to entrepreneurship, while distinct from the opportunity discovery view, is nonetheless Kersnerian in a different way. So to conclude, uh, I think the Austrian movement is quite strong, thanks to the work of Professor, Professor Kersner and, and many other uh, uh, scholars. Uh, so many in this room and, and outside this room as well. And then, of course, you know, uh, reaching out to economists, continuing to <coughs> attempt to persuade economists, both mainstream economists and heterodox economists, that Austrian economics has some unique insight, that Austrian, Austrian economics is valuable, worthy of consideration, that's important. But we should also recognize that Austrian economics already is extremely influential in some allied fields or sister disciplines, including in particular strategic management and entrepreneurship. Primarily Kersnerian discovery or Kersnerian entrepreneurship, but even other aspects of Austrian economics, uh, um, uh, Austrian capital theory, 
uh, Austrian insights on subjectivism and uncertainty, even praxeology. These ideas are alive and frequently discussed in management circles. Now, whether that has an, a sort of a tactical implication for how those of us wanting to spread the Austrian gospel should go about doing it, I leave that up to uh, your, your, uh, for you to ponder and for us to discuss during the panel, if appropriate. Thank you very much. No, 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 no. Now, uh, our next speaker is Pete Bedke, but I'm going to, sp I have five minutes, so I'm going to spend this time embarrassing him a little bit. Uh, my first, one of my earliest memories of Pete uh, was at the uh, a Cato event uh, uh, celebrating the first publication of the Economics of Time and Ignorance, and he and uh, Steve Horowitz ca came up with their books to get signed, uh, and I remember, so I, I forget who got the number one and who got the number two, but uh, they uh, came and they, they got number one and number two in terms of the signing, and I thought that Pete and, and Steve were very annoying at the time. I, I, I don't know what exactly they did. To what, what do you think now? Well, uh, so th th my first memory, <laughs> my first memory is that Pete was kind of an annoying guy. Uh, the, the second, the second early memory uh, I have is from uh, Professor Lockman, who uh, went to GMU to give a, a talk uh, and came back, and he said. So, I met a very interesting student there. His name is Burku, something like that, he <laughs> said it. So I, I said, what, who, what? Uh, and then we realized uh, who, who he was, I realized who he was talking about. And uh, Lachman said, he's a very good student and he will one day amount to something. And I think that that has turned out to be correct. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> hey. Mario didn't tell you the other story, which is that when I was a being uh, considered for being an assistant professor um, at um, uh, for NYU job, I went up to do the campus visit, had to give my paper, and then I had to go and have the meal. And uh, Mario has wonderful choices in very nice restaurants in the village, and we went to this really nice restaurant, and it was French, and it had a French menu. I don't know from French. I know from North Jersey and South Jersey. That's the only languages I know how to speak. And I was looking at this menu, and I didn't know what to do. And I leaned over to him, and I said, um, do they have a cheeseburger? <laughs> and he turned to me, and he said, that's right. You're from New Jersey. Uh, and uh, so I felt really at home uh, with that. Um, I was quite nervous uh, during that time. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I really like these uh, first two discussions and the way Don framed uh, Henry Manny's uh, paper. Uh, it's very appropriate that Henry Manny and Harold Demsetz are here in spirit. Uh, they were originally um, supposed to come here and they wanted to send their regrets to Professor Kersner. Um, in both instances, ill health is the reason uh, why they came and um, so I wanted to communicate that to Professor Kersner. Um, and uh, also, I like the way that Peter and, and uh, Don set these papers up because uh, in Don's paper, we talk about trying to sort through uh, the conceptual issue about entrepreneurship in the discussion in Henry Manny's work and, um, and the role of that in property rights system. And in Peter, uh, he's pointing out the entire field and opportunity that exists in business studies, entrepreneurship, strategic management. Um, which many of us have been following as well, but from a far distance compared to the way Peter has rolled up his sleeves and been right in the middle of that field. What I want to do in my paper is contextualize Professor Kersner's contributions in light of this particular award and the relationship between that. And so the title is Entrepreneurship, the Entrepreneurial Market Process, Israel Kersner's and the Two Levels of Analysis in Spontaneous Order Studies. It is an award from the Fund for the Study of Spontaneous Order. And I sort of am going to try to explain uh, these ideas. Simple ideas is to get across so that you can walk away with a takeaway is that entrepreneurship, the act, the entrepreneurial element of human action is evident in all human action. But the entrepreneurial market process 
exists only because of an institutional framework that enables that entrepreneurial action to be transformed into the sort of efficiency groping process which we attribute to the market economy. That is Professor Kirzner's insights and I'm going to try to present that and then stretch it a little bit in our own unique way. So let me explain why. Let's see here. So the man who um, founded this <clears throat> award is a man named Richard Cornell. Um, Richard Cornell is the inspiration and also the backer of this award. Um, he worked with uh, Bill Dennis and Leonard Liggio and myself and he had a very specific vision about what we were going to try to do with these awards. Uh, Dick Cornell, as I'll mention later on, himself was a student of Ludwig von Mises just like Israel Kirzner, except he was a student of Ludwig von Mises in the late 1940s. And after uh, working uh, with Mises at NYU as an <laughs> assistant and also at the Foundation for Economic Education, he became a program officer for the Volcker Fund. And that Volcker Fund project that he was involved with included the expansion of um, classical liberal ideas to fields like law and economics, politics and economics. So he was instrumental in the founding of the law and economics movement at the University of Chicago and the establishment of Aaron Director as a professor there. Um, it was also involved in the founding of the Thomas Jefferson Center. Um, which James Buchanan started at the University of Virginia. Um, Cornell was influenced in that because, as we'll see later, he, just like Professor Kirzner, was intrigued by a claim that Ludwig von Mises had made in human action and in his lectures. So Professor Kirzner, as I'll mention later, is very much intrigued by Mises' claim that the market is not a place or a thing, but the market is a process. And that then becomes an animating conception that drives Professor Kirzner's intellectual career. In Dick Cornell's case, it was that praxeology is a universal science in which economics is just but the most developed branch, but that it applied to all walks of human life. And so you can see this in the Volcker Fund project because what he tried to do was push the areas of praxeology in law and in politics, history, and they ran, Leonard can tell you about the various different activities that were involved in the Volcker Fund project and whatnot. In our broader project, which Dick started in the late 1990s, beginning into 2000s, was just like the Volcker Fund was charged with trying to identify people in the social sciences who believed in the classical liberal cause at its lowest moment, let's say in the 1950s, what Dick was interested in now was discovering social scientists who had a concern with the operations of spontaneous order from a methodological individualist perspective, irrespective of disciplinary home. All right, and so our first awards, um, as you can see, these are the previous award winners um, that have won. The first awards went to the team of Eleanor and Vincent Ostrom, political scientists who, um, and, and uh, political theory and political scientists and their workshop in uh, political theory and, and policy analysis. The second award winner was Gordon Tullock. He was an early pioneer again in law and economics and in political economy. Peter Berger, who was a student of Alfred Schutz, who was a student of Ludwig von Mises. And uh, what Berger did was uh, to apply a methodological individualist perspective in the field of sociology and in development studies. And then James Buchanan, um, sort of the great uh, modern political economist, the resurrector of political economy. And each of these symposiums from this have been published in, in works, just like this symposium will in fact be published. Um, and they're, they're available for you to per, uh, peruse out there. I think that's the right word. Uh, outside so you can look them, but don't take them. If you take them, we'll have to enforce some property rights on that. You know, so, um, but what did they have in common? 
uh, in this. And that is that they pushed out this methodological individualist perspective into areas which were beyond the realm of the market economy itself proper. But yet, what's our quintessential example of spontaneous order is actually the market economy. So this is the reason for this award. So there's three uh, sort of reasons that we believe Professor Kersner should be appropriately honored. The first one is this notion, as I said before, the entrepreneurial element in all of human action. The idea that it's not only a choice of the efficacious choice of means to given ends, but also over those ends themselves. And it's this nature of the human chooser in decision making uh, that drives or, or sets forth the analysis in social sciences. So it's methodological individualist perspective, but not methodological atomism. It's an extremely important uh, component to this. The second one, and the one that Professor Kirzner has emphasized the most in his work, is the theory of the market process and the entrepreneurial role in that, um, in, the, in that, that discussion. And then finally, the primacy of the institutional framework. The body of law, mores, uh, ethical codes of conduct, um, whatever you might consider to be in the framework. And that, I'm going to push on that a little bit because that's going to be one of our big debates. What do we consider in the framework? Is the monetary system in the framework? Or can the monetary system be part of the market process itself? Is the legal system? part of always the given framework? Or can the law, competition among legal systems actually work? These are going to be questions um, that are raised. <clears throat> so the first um, point that I want to make, this is a long quote from Professor Kersner about the nature of the omnipresence of entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is evident in all human choice. We are not robotic choosers. We are human choosers. In doing this paper, uh, Professor Kersner will uh, get a kick out of this, I hope. In doing this paper, when I was going back over a lot of when you do research on these kind of things, history of thought, you track footnotes of footnotes and footnotes, right? And so it leads you in all kinds of different tales. And I got a real kick out of this quote from Mises uh, from Theory and History, which was in dealing with the question of whether or not error the nature of error in, the, in, in economic decision making. And Mises says, when I pick up my gun to shoot and I miss, I'm not irrational. What I am is a bad marksman. And when I'm a doctor and I prescribe a medicine for a patient and I get him the wrong, the wrong medicine, I'm not an irrational doctor. I'm just an incompetent doctor. And then here comes the tricky one. He says, and when I'm a farmer, in the, middle, in the Middle Ages, get ready, Pete, and, uh, and I base my crops on magic. I'm not irrational, right? Just like it's not irrational for a modern farmer to base his crops on fertilizer. So Mises is making a very strong point about that you have to make a distinction between what might be an appropriate concept of error and a irrationality kind of claim. And Mises is defending the idea of rationality. Rationality, or all human action, is rational. And it's this idea of discovering our purposes and, and following our plans in that regard. And Kersner is one of the great defenders of the idea of the, of the notion of the rationality postulate properly understood in economics. In fact, one way you can think about his book, The Economic Point of View, is the consistent and persistent development of this examination of viewing economics as a science of human action. But Professor Kersner, very early in his career, focuses on microeconomics. Again, just to tell a slight joke, I have no idea if Professor Kersner will remember this or if Mario will remember this. But I remember when I was at NYU, uh, and I was doing history of economic thought. One of the things that happened to me as a young professor at NYU is I, I taught a course that was in the field of history of economic thought. And at that time, history of economic thought was a requirement for the students to get their PhDs. 
And Bill Bommel was the, uh, who wrote a lot of history of thought in his career, actually became one of the leading figures to fight against the field of history of economic thought. And uh, in one of, the, I, I loved my time at NYU, but one of my most unpleasant moments was actually in the faculty meeting in which I had to leave to go teach. And one of the senior faculty members, when I said I have to leave, but I cast my vote to keep the field, uh, he said, uh, you're undoubtedly leaving to go teach a history of thought class. And I, which I was. Uh, and uh, so, um, but Professor Kersner explained to me that uh, around the mid 1960s, um, he thought he was an economic theorist. And then he woke up one day and he realized that he was a historian of economic thought. And he never had a, you know, that idea. That was just thrust upon him by the changing nature of the discipline of economics. When, I, when, I, when, when Frederick Sauté and I started doing the collected works of Israel Kirzner for Liberty Fund, which you can see out there as well, um, my favorite book, I, I agree with Peter about the essay on capital and the notion of the plan, but my favorite book actually is Market Theory and the Price System, right there. And I love, I love the economics in that book, and I actually... Mario can tell you I suffer a sin as a reader, which is I read into things, all the things that I really like uh, rather than what actually is there. And so when I read the, the, the uh, market theory and the price system, I see all the entrepreneurship stuff that I don't think Professor Kirzner was thinking that he had yet, but I actually think it's, it's very much in there. And I recommend all of you uh, to do that. In the paper, what I try to do is I try to relate Professor Kersner's contribution in market theory and the price system to Henry Simon's Simon syllabus, which trained a generation of economists at the University of Chicago in the standard of price theory mid, right before the mid of the 20th century. And the way in which Simon sees the two tasks of microeconomics, and I try to relate Kersner's project to that. In doing this, I emphasize this idea of the two levels of the analysis in spontaneous order stories, studies, excuse me, because within a given framework of private property and freedom of contract, Kersner's argument is that the market, driven by these entrepreneurial decision makers, is going to dovetail to, or tend to dovetail towards an efficient allocation of resources. Or as he says here, the process of mutual adjustment follows the spontaneous translation of yet unexploited exchange opportunities into opportunities for pure profit um, are able to attract the attention of the most alert entrepreneurs. In doing so, you will realize the gains from trade and the gains from innovation, and you will get to what could be termed social optimal position. And you understand that through the logic of economics. Price theory works. But what Professor Kersner saw as a dangerous trend was the application, uncareful application of that spontaneous order reasoning to the framework itself. This is an example uh, from uh, his writings. Um, let me see if I can move this down a little. Does that work? Yeah, so now you can read it a little better. Um, so in this uh, passage, what I want you to focus on is <coughs> Professor Kersner identifying the, um, the idea that the English language that the children learn allows the individuals to solve a coordination problem with other speakers, but not in any way that guarantees that English is the most efficient or optimal language. In other words, within a system of property, uh, property prices and profit and loss, the interaction of the individuals will move or tend to move in a direction where price will equal marginal cost and production will be at that level which minimizes average cost. Any deviation from those conditions will throw up profit opportunities which alert individuals within the system can act upon and re reap those profits and realize those gains. But that's, we don't have an analogous process in the field of the framework itself. The way that I 
try to go forward here in, these, in, in my paper is to suggest that Kirzner's great <clears throat> contribution here was that he forces us to have a plea for mechanisms in spontaneous order stories. We treat the mechanisms within the market economy for granted because that's part of the, of the outcome of the framework. If I have a system of private property, defi definable and exchangeable and enforceable property rights, I have the incentives, I have free contracting, which gives me prices, which generates information, I have profits and losses, the profits are the lure, which lead us to innovations, the losses are disciplines, which uh, take resources away from us. Those are the mechanisms that make the system operate. Property, prices, profit, and loss. When we stretch spontaneous order explanations outside of that realm, the question is, what is the equivalent mechanisms? Right, that make sure that when we're choosing certain rules, those rules are gonna be, in fact, ones that solve our social dilemmas. Now, why do I not just take Professor Kersner's, and by the way, he's in very good company, because Jim Buchanan, as well, is a major critic of Hayekian evolutionism for precisely the same reasons as Professor Kersner. Why do I stretch it? It's because my entire professional career has been defined by studies, my own studies, of economies in which the very reason why they are not doing well is because the framework is what's up for grabs. Mainly, the post-Soviet economies failed in weak states and developing countries. It's precisely because they don't have a working framework that the system is unable to operate. And I want to suggest that we need to bring the tools that we have from Mises to provide a praxeological analysis of the emergence of the framework itself. And that's my goal. Do I agree with Professor Kirzner that we haven't justified all of those mechanisms or specified those mechanisms yet? Of course. But I think we have more mechanisms than you might imagine. All right, so this is this Misesian legacy and spontaneous order studies. Again, going back to Dick Cornell, you have the universal applicability of the study of human action in all walks of life. These Volcker Fund initiatives in law, politics, history, those are the kind of things that the Fund for the Study of Spontaneous Order we're hoping to analyze. We also have the rigorous understanding of the competitive market process of which Professor Kirzner's work is exemplary. I will conclude on this, going back to Dick Cornell. <clears throat> so Dick Cornell, in establishing this award, challenged Bill and Leonard and myself with the, with, and, and Lenore Ely as well with the following claim. We know a lot about the operation of a free economy. We know much less about the operation of a free society. Go study the free society. He insisted that we must remedy this intellectual shortcoming. A first step, I contend, in achieving this is the recognition of these two levels of analysis that Kirzner insists we recognize in spontaneous order studies. His warning about stretching spontaneous order explanations beyond the context of the market must be heeded, but turned into a challenge for us to search for those underlying mechanisms in that area. It is in identifying those mechanisms and grappling with the hard cases, as Pete Leeson refers to them, of social dilemmas and social ills that we will come to learn precisely how the entrepreneurial element in human action can be channeled to realize the gains from mutual cooperation, not only in the marketplace, but in all of human endeavors. This is how we will progress <clears throat> from our profound knowledge of how a free economy operates to our understanding of a free society. Thank you very much. I want to make some uh, remarks, uh, not about Professor Kersner's work, uh, but about another aspect of um, uh, his uh, character and uh, his career, and that is as an academic uh, entrepreneur. 
Um, maybe he doesn't like the use of the word entrepreneur here, but it's my word and <laughs> I'm going to use it. Um, there's an obvious sense in which uh, none of us would be here today if it weren't for Professor Kersner. We come to honor him. Uh, but there's an, a less obvious sense in which I think that this nice, uh, wonderful program at George Mason and the extent to which we have seen uh, the revival of uh, Austrian economics would not have come into existence were it not for a number of decisions that Professor Kersner made uh, many years ago. Um, I remember in the uh, first meeting of Professor Kersner in 1968 or, or early, late 68 or early 69, um, but it wasn't until really the early 70s, as I understand it, that Professor Kersner started to uh, uh, make uh, uh, efforts uh, to meet various funders who might be able to uh, support some activity at NYU. And along around 19... Uh, 74, 75, um, he worked with uh, George Pearson, uh, then the, I believe the Vice President of the Institute for Humane Studies, uh, to raise a number of uh, grants. Uh, and the first thing he did with that money was to bring uh, Professor Lachman to, uh, to NYU for, uh, on a, uh, an agreement to come for three years um, uh, as a uh, visiting professor. So starting in 1975, we have the beginnings of a program. Uh, in 1976, I remember receiving a call from him. I was a, I was a graduate student at uh, University of Chicago at the time. I was on the job market, and he asked me if I was interested in coming to uh, NYU as a postdoctoral fellow. Uh, and so eventually I accepted that uh, offer and uh, went to NYU. Um, in 1978, uh, Jerry O'Driscoll uh, was hired as an assistant professor. By that time, I became an assistant professor uh, at the NYU program. And then for a period of at least 10 years, from 76 to 86, uh, Israel uh, ran an important Austrian economics colloquium. Now, I believe that this program and the people it influenced at a very sensitive time uh, in the revival of Austrian economics really uh, paved the way for what we observe today. Uh, during this period of time, uh, not only uh, was uh, Jerry O'Driscoll at uh, NYU, but for various uh, periods of time, we had postdocs, uh, including people like Stefan Böhm and um, Richard Abilene, and then later Frederick Sauté, uh, graduate students like uh, Sandy Akeda, Don Lavoy, uh, Richard Fink, uh, George Selgin, uh, Don Boudreau, and then other faculty, Larry White, Peter Bedke, and then David Harper. Um, I think that this was a very important series of uh, decisions that Kersner made over a period of time in, in raising money. Uh, but also in building a program that affected so many people at a time where the interest in Austrian economics due to uh, Hayek's Nobel Prize, uh, all of that could have gone away. It could have been very uh, transient. Uh, but instead, it, it really uh, uh, continued on. Uh, it affected many people and I think ultimately made uh, the George Mason uh, program uh, possible. Uh, so I think in that sense, uh, Kersner's uh, influence on Austrian economics and on the study of uh, f uh, the free society and, its, and the market uh, goes beyond his own personal academic work, which is out there for all of you uh, to read. But I felt it was important to mention this because this is not something which many of the younger people in this audience would really know about. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's at least as important as professors' own academic work to the situation that we find ourselves in today with a really uh, vibrant uh, Austrian economics movement uh, in the United States and also in, in Europe. So we can look forward to more successes in the future, both because of Professor Kersner's research, but also because of his uh, academic entrepreneurship. Thank you.
now comes the time to make our award. I want to uh, call up uh, to the uh, platform uh, Bill Dennis. Uh, Bill Dennis uh, has been with Liberty Fund and the Goodrich Foundation, uh, is now a senior fellow at the Atlas Economic Research Foundation, and he will, he's here representing the Fund for the Study of Spontaneous Order. Bill? We have a handsome plaque here for you to commemorate this particular occasion. Uh, and it says for the group, <clears throat> the Fund for the Study of Spontaneous Orders at the Atlas Economic Research Foundation presents its Lifetime Achievement Award to Israel M. Kurtzner, Professor Emeritus of Economics at New York University, scholar, teacher, friend of liberty, in honor of his singular contributions to our knowledge of the entrepreneurial theory of the market process, the Austrian School of Economics, and the intellectual foundations of a society of free and responsible individuals, George Mason University, Fairfax, Virginia, February 7th, 2013. <clears throat> Our great pleasure in your work and success of the year. I have a second job. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It is a great honor for me to receive this lifetime award from the Fund for the Study of a Spontaneous Order. I'm deeply grateful to the Fund for bestowing this honor upon me. I'm grateful to Bill Dennis for his kind words. This award is being given in recognition of my scientific contributions to the economic theory. In all my scientific work, I have always been careful not to inject any elements of my religious faith into the substance of my work. My goal being to persuade objective students of economics that, it would, that, that work is valid regardless of religious beliefs. Nonetheless, at the beginning of each of my books on the dedication page, I have always acknowledged the divine help with which that book had been written. I believe, therefore, that it is appropriate for me at this moment to express my profound gratitude to the Creator for guiding me throughout my career. As I look back on the chains of circumstances which led me to study under my revered teacher, Ludwig von Mises, and the subsequent steps in my intellectual development, it is impossible for me to claim the credit for my life's work. I must unquestionably acknowledge the inscrutable working of the great invisible hand. But all this does not in any way diminish my profound gratitude to the Fund for the Study of Spontaneous Order for recognizing the significance of my work. I am most grateful to Professor Peter Betke for his role in arranging this award. I am deeply grateful to Professor Mario Rizzo, to Professor Peter Klein, to my absent dear friend of half a century Dean Henry Manny for the, his, for the paper that he, he, he prepared for this occasion and to Professor Don Boudreau for his uh, outstanding, brilliant 
representation, presentation of Henry Manny's work, and I'm grateful to all of them for the generous and sympathetic attention which they have given to my work today and for what I would like to consider to be their deeply perceptive evaluations of that work. <laughs> Virtually all of my work, ever since my doctoral dissertation of 1957, has consisted in rediscovering and expounding the profound insights contained in the work of my teacher Ludwig von Mises and his close disciple and colleague Friedrich A. Hayek. I emphasize the notion of expounding insights because perhaps this notion encapsulates the guiding principle of my scientific endeavors. As most authors do, I read published reviews of my books with great interest. <laughs> I must confess that most, but not quite all, of the published reviews of my books have been at best lukewarm. One of the reviews which gave me the most pleasure was, the, was a review published in the London Institute of Economic Affairs journal, Economic Affairs, in September 1997. This was a review of my book, Essays on Capital and Interest, 1996, which was recently being republished in the Liberty Fund series. And this review was written by the highly respected historian of economic thought, D.P. O'Brien of the University of Durham. He concluded his very favorable review with the following comment. The book helps to do belated justice to Mises who has been even more vilified than Hayek. It provides a remarkable contrast, contrast to the emptiness of much mainstream economics. And it demonstrates that very profound and general intellectual issues can be discussed using words. Though we may try to swim against the tide, the mathematical bog has sucked us all down. Yet mathematics is a, is a very limited language and problems have to be reformulated and simplified to fit even the language of complicated mathematics. The fascinating revival of Austrian economics reminds us forcibly of this. This is the end of the quote from D.P. O'Brien. In other words, O'Brien is in effect telling us that the revival of Austrian economics has reminded the economics profession of a statement written by Karl Menger to Leon Walrath. In his review of economic doctrines, 1870 to 1930, Terence Hutchison quoted Menger's letter to Walrath, insisting that what the economist is after is not only relationships between quantities, Grüssenverhältnisse, but the essence, das Wesen, of economic phenomena. How can we attain, Menga asks Walras, to a knowledge of this essence, for example, the essence of value, the essence of land rent, the essence of entrepreneur's profit, the essence of the division of labor by mathematics? This is the end of the Menga quote. When Mises showed us that pure entrepreneurial profit is simply the intertemporal arbitrage spread, an intertemporal arbitrage spread, he revealed the essence of pure profit. That was an insight. When Hayek showed us that the competitive market process is a process of mutual discovery, he revealed the essence of the market process the essence of spontaneous order. <coughs> if I could genuinely believe that in my participation in the exciting revival of Austrian economics during the past 40 years, if I could believe that I have been able to contribute something to the Menga Mises Hayek tradition of illuminating the intellectual horizon through attaining excitingly satisfying insights 
into economic processes, then I would certainly feel a deep sense of personal satisfaction. My profound thanks to the Fund for the Study of Spontaneous Order for today's award is my expression of gratefulness for the Fund's encouragement to me to be able indeed to feel entitled to this satisfaction. Thank you so much.